Hello everyone, it's 3.30 Chicago time, 4.30 Eastern on Thursday, the 7th of June, 2018. Thanks for being here. Uh, I know many people can't attend live, so many have registered. Uh, over 600 have registered actually, uh, and we'll get that video out to you as, as soon as possible. Derivative trading involves substantial risk of loss is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Um, so, uh, I have Yoda here with me. Yoda is, uh, is a long time, um, contributor, uh, to, to what I'm doing and, um, and he's going to hold me to five minutes per question. If we stick to that schedule, we'll only handle 12 questions. <laughs> I'm sure there are going to be many, uh, but he'll interrupt and let me know that, uh, I'm going long. Uh, so let's start out with whatever questions we have. Um, if we don't have any, a few of you have submitted some in the comments of the invitation page. We'll address those as well. Uh, let's get going, uh, Yoda. Okay, so the first question is, what do you recommend to determine your, quote, full clip position size based on your account size? Oh, hang on. This is moving on me. Okay. <laughs> questions are rolling in. Here we go. Um, uh, for example, if I had a $25,000 account trading the ES with a risk of 2% per trade and a max daily drawdown of $750. Okay, so there are several more factors needed to determine the clip size um, because it, it, um, it, the periodicity is a big part of that. Uh, the periodicity is, is a big part of that. So let's say that your daily loss limit is $750, but you're trading off of a 60-minute bar on the ES, uh, which may require you to have, say, a seven-point stop, right? Uh, if that's the case, uh, if that's the case, then the maximum you can trade is two contracts because you're risking $350 per contract before you hit your daily loss limit. But the idea is you want to you wanna get as many trades in before you hit your daily loss limit, if you're going to hit your daily loss limit, as possible. So let's assume you're trading on a much shorter time frame. Uh, $750 daily loss limit is, is pretty good. The account size is excellent. You can start by defining the largest uh, amount you can you can have on for your account and you can do that through using the exchange margin per contract so what you would be doing is you'd be trading at full margin per contract uh, currently the margin for the S&P minis it has changed and I don't think it has changed back but let me uh, pull that up real quick I, I generally don't um, look at margins often so the S&P mini margin is currently 6160 so $6,160. So that gives you, what is that, four contracts max that you can trade with. So you could start with that. Uh, so the four is the maximum you can have on. However, for your loss limit, I would say to get the number of opportunities that you need, you probably should be trading around two contracts. Uh, so what I'm doing, the math there, is, 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 is a function of how big your stop is, which is a function of how big, how, what your periodicity is. So you have to combine all those. What is reasonable? What is reasonable is to have a stop where the market has to work hard to get, to get at it. Okay, so if you uh, if you put your stops within the noise of the S and P, like six ticks or eight ticks, that's in the noise. Uh, then you're probably going to hit that daily loss limit of seven hundred fifty dollars pretty quickly. Okay, but if your loss limit needs to be outside of that, say three points at a minimum, or three and a half points, now you need to compute how many contracts can I afford to have on with a three-point stop loss. You know, a three-point stop loss is $150 per contract, uh, so that's $300 per trade, so that gives you two and a half trades before your daily loss limit. So, so to answer your question, I can't answer it. 
with the information that I have, but I hope that I helped you box it in. Um, again, you want to put your stops not in obvious areas, but in areas where the market has to truly work hard to get to that stop. It has to push through, say, in my way of looking at things using volume profile, uh, it has to get through a high volume node, for example, or has to go through a low, a key low volume node and start moving to the other side. And oftentimes, if you're disciplined, you can head that off. You can see that the trade is failing before it actually gets to your stop. Now, be careful that you're not micromanaging a trade. Next question. Okay. Next question. What do you, uh, that one we did, I have noticed sometimes when a market leaves an MC value area and comes back to the MC high volume node, it chops around and consolidates around the price, building further value. Other times, it swiftly rejects the MC high volume node and searches for value elsewhere. Are there any contextual clues that may alert us to which has a higher probability as we approach the MC high volume node, as well as the market behavior at the time of the test. All right, let's break that down a little bit. Let's talk about what an MC is. Let's talk about these things really briefly. Um, so let's clean this up. Let's clean this up. Okay. So here's a market that's been moving around. Uh, you know, you, you've this is a this is a 15 minute per bar uh, RTH only or day session only chart as the market gapped up and it started to move away you can easily identify a trend here so let me bring my tool set over so in order to answer this question I need to make it uh, relevant to everyone who's in attendance so we're going to do that real quick so you can see here you can identify very quickly that we have a trend. As soon as this happens, as soon as this day happened here, or as soon as the market rolls over on itself, okay, what we want to do in that situation, and hopefully your software can manage this, what you want to do is draw a microcomposite, and it's abbreviated MC. And so with this, what we're doing is we're simply looking at what is in that space. What's what's the what is that, what are those three days made up of, okay, and the balance day. So the market has basically uh, taken away the trend and it's moving into balance. And so here we are, we have an MC. And what this MC does is it combines all of the volume at those prices and lines them up for you so you can see a hist statistical histogram of what's happened okay and clearly from this MC there's no balance and so the next day comes along and it starts to build balance you see how it's getting fatter and fatter and fatter in the middle fatter and fatter and fatter in the middle and that's what this question is about as as the market moves back into the, the the high volume node it starts to trade around it because that is the most accepted price by volume the volume is telling you that there's no indicator or anything needed so the question is why does it sometime go, sometimes go back to the MC point of control, which on this chart says black line? It is the highest volume price or the mode. Statistics, it's called the mode. What is the price that has the highest population on it? Uh, so that's the most accepted price. It's the point of control. Okay? And so why does it sometimes come in and chop around like it's doing here or started to do here? Uh, and why does it sometime run through? What contextual information can we use to figure out if it is likely to chop in there or it's likely to break through? And the contextual information is who is in control? You as a trader should, should always, we can never know because there are uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of participants that can be in this market. We can't know which participant has the most power for that particular session or for that particular segment of that particular session. But an MC, a microcomposite, is like a swing time frame. It's an intermediate time frame. And if the market comes back to it, we expect intermediate time frame traders to respect it. We expect short time frame traders to respect it. If it's blowing through, the clue you're getting there is a high time frame is an action and so it doesn't care. Higher time frames aren't looking at a three or four day or six day MC. They're not. 
they are they are moving like this they are essentially doing this kind of movement the trend you see this delta just dropping off very quickly you see the volume is very high the little white and orange bars above the black bars which is the average for that period the, these guys don't care about your MC they don't care about yesterday's high they don't care about uh, yesterday's close they're doing business in a much wider range uh, an OTF can get in and out of the market in a 15 20 point range that's the range for them to just get into a position so they don't care about that so that's so you when you see that the MC is not being respected can you predict it probably not but the fact that it's just running right through an MC that's been respected for days and days and days the fact that it's running right through is a big clue to tell you that the higher time frame is in control there is a trend being established possibly and so on and so forth that's what you can take away from that remember as traders we're just investigators picking up the clues and giving it our best hypothesis or our best guess okay so that's that's the best I can do with that question sounds good next question in your flex levels you sometimes show measured moves though I never see you measure with fibs or anything or etc in your trader bytes how do you calculate measured moves and how do you trade them okay so measured moves to me are a mathematical a mathematical tool I'll show you where that comes from here's my flex entry chart okay this is my flex levels chart very simple they're daily bars okay and while the market's trending up and there is no precedence in other words we remember I'm trading an, au an auction you're trading an auction everybody's trading an auction and the best information I have is from the last time we were auctioning this area that's the best information that's available to me okay but if there was no auction here because we're at all-time highs like back in this run back here if you can see my cursor uh, my pointer back here the S&P didn't have precedence and in that case I have to resort to math right but my preference is always to trade off of the auction off of value off of the, the, the profile off of the character or the features uh, and structure of the profile when that ceases then I start to build these fib extensions and what am I doing here I'm not doing Gartley patterns I'm not doing any other geometry I'm really not I'm, I'm a simpleton when it comes to trading this is off because of the uh, rollover um, I'm a simpleton when it comes to trading okay and so all I'm doing with these is I'm looking for this swing and then I go and I create another fib extension and look at let's say we just stopped at this swing okay and I overlay those and I look for confluence that's it it's that simple so I'm looking at every swing and I'm pushing it up and I'm plotting the 100% the 138 the 150 161.8 the 200 and wherever I have confluence that becomes a measured move level so you can see that that measured moves do not exist from within the profile I don't have any measured move um, flex levels inside of the profile inside of where we traded I don't need them there because I have better information in my opinion so I'm using measured moves outside of the profile I'm using measured moves in new territory and these levels here that you see 29 27 75 28 93 even these levels come from confluences of multiple stacked um, fib extensions right from the pullback and so we can sit here and debate well why are you doing it from the pullback why not extend the high uh, why not why aren't you p paying attention to the golden ratio you know the 61.8 is the most important one or the 50 percent I don't want to debate it I don't really care what I care about is when multiple time frames or multiple swings all fall on top of each other that's a measured move and I'm not talking about to the tick I'm looking for a zone if there's if they if they're you know 
three points between them. I just put one there and I make it thick and that's it. And how do I use those measured moves is, a, I think, the second part of the question. Uh, the way I use them is as targets. I, I expect that if I'm long into a measured move that's higher, I will lighten up. And the logic that I have behind it, not that I've read it in the book or anything, the logic I have behind it is because I'm hitting different time frames and there's a confluence of different time frames, there's likely, there's a better opportunity that there, there would be a reaction at that measured move than not. Okay? Yodes? Sounds good. Yep. Somebody was asking if you could start defining some of your terms that you use in your pre-market videos, such as stock area, MCLVN, Sigma down. Okay, so here I invite you, you know, I've been working on this, I, I launched this new company, uh, part of launching this new company called Convergent Trading that many of you are probably already a part of. Hang on, let's open this up, and I'll show you where to get that. Dang it. I have to do this incognito. One second. Dead air, not a good thing. Is this the magician that's sort of working the magic <laughs> behind the scenes? <laughs> so here, this is the website, just convergentrading.com. Just go to useful info, go to trading glossary, and the stuff is there, okay? And as things are pointed out, stock zones, this is a public site. This isn't the member site. The member site is locked for members only. You can open it up and see what that is. So I invite you to bookmark convergentrading.com forward slash trading dash glossary and you'll find your answer there. Next. With convergent trading, what kind of mentorship and personalized trading review is given? Um, I, so briefly, convergent trading is, is a multi-phase um, plan or strategy. Uh, there is no mentoring there. Convergent trading is intended to mimic what I did and had uh, and experienced as a prop uh, shop owner here in Chicago for futures, okay? And so the, the intent is to bring people together who are serious about becoming career professional traders and to give them a space that is noise-free. That is just trading, pure trading, right? So I don't want to. I don't want to hear noise about some conversation. I'm interested in what's the market doing now. How are you looking at it? What are you going to do about it? Uh, so I would say that you know the best the best way to find out is to just go to the to the website but really it's just a virtual prop environment that's phase one is bringing all the traders together many people come in many people leave that's okay they figure that it's not for them and then the second phase is finding matching people together uh, as we grow and develop part of the uh, community is continuous weekly or sometimes twice weekly like June's calendar is packed um, uh, lessons or sessions, study hall sessions, order flow, how to use a footprint slash volume scope, uh, things like that, using tools. So it's a continuous thing. And that's what you would get in a prop shop. And so uh, that's the first phase. So it's not a signal room. I'm not interested in creating uh, a service that provides signals or whatever. That's not what convergent is. It's it's a place for serious traders to get together and to to grow together, right? And there's a lot of that happening. So there are many channels uh, for the various aspects of trading and various products. And there's a read-only channel for head traders, for myself and two others uh, that post on the ESCL and the, the notes. And over time, I expect there will be more and more head traders, just like in a real prop shop. In a prop shop, nobody's giving you a signal. Nobody. What they're giving you is a base. They're giving you a place to build your structure and build your information and to develop your own signals, to develop your own approach, but to have it done in a focused way so that you're not hopping from one place to the next to the next, wasting time. That's what that is. And that's eaten up all of my focus 
for the last two and a half months, we lost, launched March 14th, and that's why I'm quiet on Twitter because I'm very active or as active as I can be, I can be in the chat portion. Later on, the emerging trader prop, the prop trader program gets launched, and, and that's a whole different ball of wax. But that's a summary of what that is. Okay. What do, you use to, what do you use to identify bracket early in the session if you're likely to see a choppy day versus a trend day? Okay, so I get asked that a lot. What I use to identify is really simple stuff. You have, to, you have to start off by asking, where are we opening compared to the prior day's auction? Okay, where are we opening? This is a two-tick Renko chart. Let's switch to a four-tick Renko because of the noise, because of today's noise. But the first question is, where are we opening compared to the prior day? That's clue one, number one. What kind of opening are we getting? What kind of an opening are we getting once we get going? So uh, are we, do we have a push right off the open? Do we have a market that's snaking around the open back and forth, back and forth, back and forth? Or do we have a market that has pushed one way, found the opposing participants, like it pushed down like it did today, found buyers in what looked like an open test drive, but it's actually an open auction today, and it just pushed to 27.83 and a quarter. That tells me, hey, don't get, don't get short, okay? And in fact, in our in the convergent chat room, that's what I said. Hey, caution if you're getting short uh, because, because of the kind of move that we had up. So those are the other clues. How, where are we versus value if we're opening in range? Where are we versus the most recent trading range or the micro composite? Those are all areas, uh, those are all areas that, th those are all clues that help. The other thing that helps is you can't use it right now because we rolled over into September today, so the volume or the delta is not very reliable. The volume is not going to be reliable at all until next Friday or next Friday afternoon uh, after expiration. But the delta tells me because the delta is not measuring just – here's the delta chart that I keep on the side. In fact, uh, so this is the ES up top. Okay, and what this tells me is not only is the volume profile telling me the volume that's being traded at every price, which I don't need to plot here because I have it right here, but it's telling me what kind of volume is coming in, what kind of an aggressor is there, okay? And I separate these to large lots and small lots. Small lots are orange, large lots are white. And uh, the current... Statistically, the current separator is 30 contracts. 30 contract prints and up are large lots. Everything below that is a small lot. So I look at who's in control. This helps me see who's in control of the auction. Another reason I said don't get short today early on, which was wrong, it happens, is large lots came in and they were the buyers early on. Very quick, you see that white line pop up and you see the, the small lots were sellers to the large lots early on. So those are just some of the clues. And then as the market um, as the market trades and you have an opening swing, then later on you have an IB, then later you have a developing point of control. and a de Those are all things that start to accumulate to tell you what the story is, what the narrative is. And that's when, that's how I know, hey, this is consolidating in a very small uh, range but volume is normal. If that's the case, look out. Later in the session, it's likely to fall out of balance. So if it moves out of here aggressively, I should not trade against that move. It's probably likely to establish a trend, that sort of thing. So when we talk about context, that's what we mean. Next. Okay. What's your stance with daily POC shift, point of control? What, many times when the POC shifts up, sellers come in, question mark. You notice that, question mark. What is that, and how do you handle POC shifts? Okay, I just recently did a, um, a study hall session on this. If you're a Convergent member, you have access to that, but I'll answer it for everybody else. VPOC shifts, the point of control, the most, the most traded price of the day by volume shifting tells us something. 
it tells us that there was enough interaction at a price that is considered temporarily at the moment that is considered fair and so a lot of tr uh, participants will trade at that price the tighter the the vpoc the more the less likely it's going to hold the less likely that it is in fact establishing balance and so it's likely to cause a push one way or another so if we look at yesterday yesterday's profile is really ugly this is an ugly profile only its mother could like it right so very zigzaggy whereas the profile from a few days ago you can see it's fairly Gaussian fairly balanced we could see that the, the market has found its equilibrium point days like yesterday get a lot of epoch shifts and what these tell me is if the market is trading up here and so it's forming a profile more and more trading occurs there and then it starts to break it goes into imbalance breaks and it forms another VPOC so now the profile looks like this so the VPOC shifted from here to here is this telling me that this market is done is this telling me that okay they found buyers and so there are enough buyers now to sell to take to buy what the sellers are selling as they trended down that this could be the end of the move no is it's not telling me that is it telling me that it may continue lower that it's gonna continue lower it should or needs to or must continue lower because now the, the they're accepting a lower price and therefore it should fall and therefore I should get short in this area is it telling me that no it's not all it's telling me is is that there's energy that moved and energy in terms of volume right people are going to feel the pain when they're all these people that uh, that bought to, from the sellers to form this volume remember for every contract that is traded there has to be a buyer and a seller or nothing happens it just tells me that hey a lot of people are holding these contracts long or short one side is likely to be wrong and what it is and the sharper that point of control becomes the more powerful the move, the more energy, the more potential energy is in that move if you're a scientist. And so as the VPOC shifts down, it doesn't tell me that it's probably going to shut off. It's just telling me the energy has moved down, so be careful. So if I'm short and the VPOC shifts and I happen to be short and the VPOC is below me, so it moved up, moved down, and I moved and then it moved up. And then over time, I'm short up here. Let's say I'm short up here, and it's trade. It starts to trade enough to shift the VPOC down, and it pops back up. I have to be careful, even though I'm trading with the trend. I have to be careful because it it could be that there's an there are enough buyers absorbing the selling that now sellers are likely to weaken. This we see this happen at the end of the day often as the book the the book rebalances at the end of the day and so a VPOC shift only informs you that there's a shift in energy there's a shift in the way in where the power is for what not for the current move but for the next move so a VPOC shift simply informs you that hey look out there's enough that's gone in here that you may um, you may have the next move. Is the next move lower or higher? I don't know. It's not predictable. If it was that easy, you could just create a system that says if the VPOC shifts down, sell the crap out of it and hold, you know. But a VPOC shift could mean buyers have been found. The VPOC shift down could mean buyers have been found and it could now start to squeeze sellers. Or a VPOC shift down means a lot of late uh, late, weak buyers have come in a lot of buyers have come in and as soon as it starts moving down uh, the move the continuation move may be another impulse it may have a lot of energy in it to continue so if I'm short I'm gonna hang as tight as I can in that scenario again it's all about the narrative and context next Sounds good just, just to let people know um, there's a lot of questions so I'm right now limiting you to one question so if you get a couple of questions in and you're wondering why your second or third question is not being answered um, that's why if we have time at the end I'll circle back to the questions that are been asked by more than or also, multiple questions okay we should reduce the time to about three minutes sounds good uh, 
I tend to hold on to losses and cut my winners too quickly. Any advice on this problem? And I'm really glad you limit this one to three minutes because you could go on a whole hour oh, for this man. one. <laughs> this is the bane of every trader's existence, and it's a, it's a psychological problem more than anything. Okay? Um, so the, the key element that you're dealing with with this is your inability or um, not inability or you're just not – um, figuring out a way to accept your losses. That's all that is. You are going into trades believing that because I got into a trade, this has to be a winner. When actually the facts are, in real life, it's completely random. It's completely random. There's nothing you can control about a loss. Nothing. So why would you extend the loss and cut a win? Both of those, the win and the loss, actually have an equal opportunity of fulfilling their destiny, period, every time. So today, for example, my trading took the first trade, loser, took the second trade, loser, took the third trade, winner. Could I have predicted that the third trade is going to be a winner? No, there's no way. But I saw a setup, I took it, and it worked out. Didn't compensate for the losers, so down for the day. And that's just part of trading. I accept that this is what it is. So what you're doing is you're trading to win. No, don't trade to win. You want to trade to follow a process to, to expose your edge. You're digging for gold. And it doesn't show up as a big steel trunk from a pirate ship. It shows up as little pieces of dust and a little little crusts and things like that and you collect those over time and you put those together and now you have a big gold bar that's what it takes and what people do is they do as much as they can to guarantee that that next trade is an absolute winner and they put it on when they believe it's an absolute winner and then if it doesn't work then they have not left any room in their awareness and their risk control for the loss and it could be a loss. You could do things absolutely perfectly, and it could come out to be the absolute same outcome. So the biggest issue you've got is you're not accepting the loss before you set the before you set you set up the trade. You're also not um, you really don't understand why you're trading. You have a low confidence in your trading, uh, and you're just not accepting the random nature of what we do. We are completely random in trading in, in, in terms of trade to trade outcomes. You have to accept this fact. Everybody does. That was three minutes. Yes, it was very nice. <laughs> A couple of people asking what time frame do you trade? Uh, someone said in your daily video you illustrate market action using a two tick Renko bars. Do you trade off the two tick Renko bars? Uh, and if so, how do you put the stops on number of bars? Okay, uh, good question. So I trade the narrative. I trade the story. I trade the, the, what the market is saying it wants to do. So if I looked at this chart here by itself, oh my God, it's, the market's just completely sideways and it's not doing anything. That's one point of view. And then I look at this chart and I say, well, we're in a clear uptrend here. It's a clear uptrend. So for me personally, I'm trading the story. So this is what the Trader Bytes about. It's about looking at the narrative, looking at the context of what's going on and establishing just a general game plan for each scenario. Those are your scenario one, two, three, four, five at a minimum. And so, and then we wait for the market to show us, to reveal to us which scenario the stronger participant uh, participants in the market are willing to play out and those participants change from time to time one day they they could be long and winning and the next day they could be long and and losing I base my content contextual read on the profile and the profile does not change it is it is completely agnostic to the periodicity that I use to my time frame a trade that the, that went off at 27.83, a contract that went off at 27.83 and a quarter at the high today, is the same 
in a 15 minute bar, in a one minute bar, in a 60 minute bar, or a 240 minute bar, or a one tick bar. It's the same. It's just volume at that price. The trigger chart that I'm showing you is the detail. So I use this for detail as to where things are. So I can see from the trigger chart the price action. What is the price action that is coming into the, 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 uh, the current setup? And I'm using my stock zones as the areas that I want to interact with the market with. So the two areas to interact for me, pre-planned stock zones, which happen, which I do pre-market, and they don't change during the session, or market-generated levels like the mid and the IB and the open and things like that. And that's it. It's simple. Not easy, it, but simple. That's how these things fit together. Excellent. I use this Sierra charts, but follow the FT71 method of market analysis. Is there a way to duplicate the setup of investor RT charts onto Sierra? There probably is. I don't use Sierra. I know that uh, many, um, I, I haven't had much exposure to it. I know that many members uh, at Convergent are Sierra users, some have even developed plugins to bring the stock zones into their charts because they're dynamically updated on a cloud server and stuff. You can copy everything that's there. I believe Sierra gives you the ability of using C or C++ to create whatever uh, Investor RT has. I could only speak to what I use, honestly, uh, and so I don't know. I just know that you can recreate what you want. Uh, for me, Investor RT is just a rock solid package. It's a professional grade pa package that's not ridiculously expensive, so that's what I use. I can't talk too much about Sierra because I know you can share chart books and things, and I think there are folks who can create those, and, and that's one of the things we're creating is is the same tools for uh, Sierra as for Ninja as for you know multi charts or whatever else to help everybody be on the same plane. Uh, playing field when it comes to information. Uh, there's not much more I can say about that. Okay, we got a few questions on products and so the first question is other than the high liquidity why trade the ES? The Z ZN and the YM seem to be slightly more technical. Um, okay, so the reason the ES is not my favorite product but because I grew up as a scalper, as an equity SOS bandit who switched over to high volume future scalping. So my bread and butter are, are thinner products. So for me, it's the FDAX, it's the, it's the Russell, it's the NQ, it's products like Crude. That's, those, those are the products I used to scalp. I stopped scalping around 2006 when I switched, that's when I made the switch to a structured uh, approach to trading involving initially market profile and then volume profile. The reason I trade the ES is because it is orderly when it moves. <laughs> a lot of times it doesn't move. But the amount of, of bite, the amount of bite that you can take out of the ES in a month like February or March or April where the volatility is very high and rotations, the harmonic rotation jumps from two and a half points per rotation to about four and a half points, it's tremendous. You can trade size, like I can't put on a 50 lot in the DAX, that's very, very heavy in that product or the Russell. In the ES, they'll slurp it up at one price, no problem. Uh, the ES has the liquidity to be orderly. It's just sometimes very difficult to read. Same with the ZN. The ZN has the liquidity and so on. But the ZN has been pretty dead for years. The curve trade had died in 2006, 2007, 2008. Actually, it was after 2008. It died, and, and it, that product might have a six-tick range for days. It's just now moving because it's breaching these... Um, yields that are that are pushing through and so on um, so it's moving around so it is a very viable product a ZN is an active product a convergent right there's a room dedicated to it a channel that's dedicated to it but the ES is something that everybody understands it's got okay margins and it's got a, 
a nice structure. The Dow is a, is a good product, the only, and that's the first product, the first futures product I, tr I learned on was the Dow. Uh, uh, the Dow is great, except the Dow is, is actually relatively easy to mimic to re reproduce because it's such a small number of stocks and it is price weighted. Uh, it's a price weighted index instead of a, um, a capital weighted in the market cap weighted index. Uh, so it's, it's not that hard to ARB or machine trade the Dow. So I find that it gets noisy sometimes. Uh, so it just depends on the approach. Now here's the thing, you as a trader, find your soup. Find the, the ingredients to make your soup. Whatever works for you, for your approach, just use that. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. In, in the end, you own your plan. You own the results of your plan. You own the business of trading that you're running for yourself. Excellent. Do you trade the NQ? Is another question. I used to when the ES was dead, like in the summer of 2016, I actually would recommend the people I interacted with, I would recommend to get out of ES I think it may have been even late 2015, I would recommend get out of ES, there's just nothing there, and move to the NQ, or at least, at least it, it has some rotations, it has some structure. However, in a high volatility environment, like the last three months, it's a difficult product to trade because it blows right through um, areas that you would consider, you would think would get a reaction, uh, and that's when I would switch back to the ES and I don't have, I'm not condoning that you should trade multiple products. It's not a good idea. Uh, however, I, I, I know my discipline. I know I'm confident in my trading. I know what I'm doing. It's not an issue for me to pull up RBOB and trade it. I might take a loss a day or two or so, but after a couple of days, I'll figure it out. Or Nat Gas or Cotton or Cocoa. It doesn't matter. The product doesn't really matter. So again, just like I said to the previous question, Yes, I do jump from product to product as needed, but find the one that makes sense to your account size and to your risk tolerance and to your style and stick with it. What you need to do if you're not consistent is master one product. You need to cut your teeth on one product. Be a master at that product and you'll find that looking for the same things in other products requires some adjustment but nothing dramatic. So you can expand, you can diversify and expand your ability to trade. You can always find a legitimate setup somewhere else if your market is dead. Okay, I got a couple of people who are non-ES traders and non-convergent traders and they're wondering, uh, for example, they traded one trades the 6E, another trades the DAX. I'm just wondering how many people are non-ES traders in the room and would convergent resources be helpful to them? Well, uh, this session was not intended to is, is not intended to be a marketing thing for Convergent. I think Convergent will will grow just by people talking, telling other people about it. To be honest, uh, there is we we have DAX master levels, we have DAX stock zones, um, and so it is relatively active. There's a European channel. There's a European markets channel where all of that's being discussed all the time, including the Bund and the Euro stocks. Uh, the 6E, we also do master levels and stock zones for the 6E. There's a gentleman, uh, Trade for Ticks, who's, uh, who's uh, a contributor to that. Uh, and and the, that uh, product is not as active. Uh, but I, can't I can tell you that if you want to move away from SIM and really trade, like really trade, the best product you can do that on is probably the M6E using 6E charts. Um, I, I have a video on that that I did with the CME many moons ago, maybe in 2013. You can find it on my um, my website. Uh, so, but but in convergent, the 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 FX and crypto channels are not that busy. They will be, but they're not that busy right now. Whether or not convergence content and what I'm doing there is useful to you, that's for you to determine. Uh, but my goal is to just form as much of a cohesive group of serious traders, even if it's just five of them, I don't care, uh, to grow together, right? So I'm learning from other people as they're learning from me and so on. Uh, there are many ideas. So to me, I believe it's a beneficial environment no matter what, because if you're serious about trading, now if you're looking for a place to go chit chat and 
get away from the boredom. This is not for you if you're looking for signals. This is not for you if you're looking for me to mentor you and resolve your issues personally. This is not for you. It's really for us to all grow as a group with a concentrated effort at, at educating people about things they may not get exposure, exposure to by Googling it or by being a part of the forum and so, so on. Okay? okay, so that's the that's the baseline of that. That's good. How do you keep tabs on multiple markets and identify the best opportunities throughout the trading day? Many screens. Uh, I don't need much to be able to see what's going on. In fact, if I can get a glimpse, if you can give me this, for example, for a market, let's say today opens, right? So here's yesterday's close. Oh, no, I went too far. Okay, here's yesterday's close. This is what the market looked like coming in. This is the end of yesterday's close. What I need is I need the open, so I need the first bar. I need the opening swing, so I need the first touch down or up and reversal. The first touch, this, the second touch down uh, or up and reversal, and the breach of that. So the location of the open and the opening swing and the opening type tells me if I should pay attention to the market or not. If we open in the middle of a balance, like if we open in the middle of this here, point of control, the prior day is completely balanced as you see here or here, and we open and we're just going up and down. I know that that market has short-term traders in it, uh, and I'll, I'll, there's no interest. I don't want to compete with short-term traders. There's not much money there. Uh, what I want to see is a market that's really testing one extreme and another extreme and another extreme. Then that market becomes front and center. How do I track it? I have a lot of alarms. So I have voice alerts that tell me uh, NASDAQ low, and if I hear uh, new low NASDAQ, new low NASDAQ, new low NASDAQ, new low NASDAQ as the S&P sitting sideways, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring my NASDAQ chart up. I'm going to look at it, and if it, if it looks like I might get some uh, a pullback, a mid pullback setup, a breach of IB setup, an IB stat setup, an overnight stat setup, those kinds of things, then the dome comes up and I'll pull up the order book for that product uh, to see what's going on. So I'll just simply add the NASDAQ here and start tracking start tracking its, uh, its order flow and so on and just looking for opportunities in there. The way I trade is pretty consistent across all products, so it's, it's simple. Um, but it's just a matter of getting enough information to decide whether that's good enough for me or not. It's kind of like it's kind of like going into a restaurant that has a menu of maybe you know 12 dishes. It's really about looking at the first ingredients to decide if that's something that suits your palate, and then moving on. Uh, I don't switch back and forth all day long. I don't do that. Once I start trading the NQ. In addition to the ES, that's all I'm trading. I'm trading the NQ in addition to the ES. Like I wouldn't close the NQ and bring a third market in or a fourth market in. I don't think I could do well doing that. Okay. Do you use footprint charts? And if so, how? Well, if you are a convergent member, we're doing we're doing a study hall session so we can go over that actually on the 14th next Thursday I do look at footprint charts for about the last uh, maybe nine years I did not look at them uh, I used to have market Delta charts and so on uh, but recently pursuant to a conversation with one of the members at convergent I started to look at it and it is something so I I, I taken his chart I modified it rebuilt it to understand what's in it to my taste and I, I use it. I do look at what, what's going on. I'm not interested in how much is trading against how much, like some people use the, 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 the volume scope or the footprint chart for that. I don't use it for that. I use it more to look at, okay, on this point and figure chart, it's a tick by 10 in the ES. What is the quality of the move down? Where is the heavy Where's the heavy volume in the move down? That's what these black dots and yellow boxes are for. Uh, did we move up? Like if you look at this morning's high, let's move back to that. So if we look at this morning's high, you could see that we we opened, we tested down, 
Uh, on the test down, the delta remained positive. So the volume scope shows it's just dwindling as we reach the bottom here. Uh, and it ended up positive. And so the next move up gets higher volume. And we could see the prints all the way up until it, it, uh, it dried up at 13 contracts traded at the high. The next bar is an inside bar. The next bar makes a run at that high again, but it's on a negative delta, so I expect the next bar to be lower, which it was. Sometimes it can be confusing. You might get to, um, you might get a, a strong negative print at the high, and then it'll just rip right up. Uh, you, you can never tell, but uh, I do use it. I will never. Uh, I won't say that I'm an expert at it or it's a main tool for me because it's not, uh, but it's something as part of my continuing education, it's something that I'm looking at and I do see value in it. Excellent. Okay, we have about 10 minutes. Question. Why, why volume profile versus market profile? Uh, so I've talked about this a lot in the past. Market profile is okay. Uh, the problem with market profile, here it is, uh, and look at this chart every once in a while, right? The problem with market profile is it's based on time. I learned back in 2005, 2006, once I dissected market profile and actually was computing value areas, um, value areas and value area shifts in my head, um, I recognized that it's built on time. These are 30-minute brackets, each one of these. So if we split this profile and we zoom in, all these letters represent is that's, here's the first 30-minute bar. This is where it opened. This is how high it got. This is how low it got. Here's the second 30-minute bar. It opened here. That's how high it got. That's how low it got. It extended, it extended the first bar. D bar extended C bar. E bar took that back. F bar has the same bottom. It's struggling, and so on and so forth. It's based on time. And what I've come to realize for me, and this doesn't mean it's true for everybody, is I don't really care about time. That's why I use Renko charts and so on. I don't like using it. What's the difference? Somebody says, oh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the trend reverses once we close above you know, once the five-minute bar closes above the 20-period average, maybe, but why five-minute bar and why a 20-minute period? That's 200 minutes of lag. Why would you, why, why that? Why that versus a 15 or three-minute or two-minute or even a minute and a half or three minutes and a half? It just doesn't make sense to me. So I moved to volume profile because I had the tools, and it's, it was actually by accident that I discovered this. I, I was always I always traded on X Trader Pro, and one of the things they had, just like I have in Bookmap here, is they had this profile that would form next to the dome. So this would exist next to the dome, just like this. And what I started to notice is how the market responded in 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 higher volume areas versus lower volume areas. And so I started to notice that I can trade. I can take pretty good trades in lower volume areas, especially in thinner products. And so I started to look at volume profile instead of market profile, and that's that's it's all history from there. That's why I'm I'm, I'm a proponent of it because the volume profile doesn't care about time. It's just showing you how many contracts traded at that price from the beginning of the session or from whenever you tell it to. So it's the same. So my volume profile looks exactly the same whether it's it's at any period periodicity and that makes sense to me because time is not a factor in trading intraday trading in my opinion except for news releases and things like that um, so that's really why I switched and I never looked back excellent for a typical trade where you average down on building a position how do you manage your stop once your position is built do you trail your stop albeit mentally or simply wait for a target Okay, that's a complex question, and I'll try to answer it here. Let's say I am buying, let's say I'm a seller. So let's 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 sell this, okay? Let's pretend like I'm selling this. So let's pull up the ES. Let's go back in time. Time. Okay, let's go back in time here and look at this run-up. Let's ex extend that run-up. Let's say this is a pullback 
continuation trade. So what I'm looking for here is the market pushes higher for me to sell for a continuation down, okay? And I don't know how high it's going to go. So the first thing we have to notice is that this is a planned scale-in trade. So I'm not just taking a short and then, oh my God, it's going against me. Let me average up. Oh my God, it's terrible. Let me average up some more. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. That's just, I'm sorry to say, that's just dumb trading. You're just giving away your money. What I'm talking about is a planned trade. So I want to get short, but I don't know if it'll get through yesterday's close. So I'll sell there. How much will I sell? It's a function of how deep this is versus my stop. Okay, so if this is really deep, I'll break up my unit to sixth, one one sixth, or one eighth, or one quarter, and I'll sell, knowing that my stop, the value of my stop is say twelve hundred dollars. Okay, overall, my stop, however, doesn't change. Let's say, let's say I get filled right here, and my stop is right here. Okay, and it's a it's a structural stop. I don't use uh, prior high or anything like that. And I get filled now. So I've got two on at 27.76, let's say for argument's sake, and I've got two more on at 27.77. My average is 27.76.50 for four contracts. So I'm managing the stop based on that average. Okay, And it start, continues to move higher and so I add at 27.78 as part of my plan. So I'm building a position. My stop is still here. It's still there. It's just that now my stop is worth maybe $900 rather than $1,200. Once I add the last, the fourth, and hold my stop, it'll become $1,200. So the stop is a function of, you know, if I'm using a structural stop, so that's, this is one area, one example. If I'm using a structural stop, it stays where it is. It's just I have less risk, and if I get stopped, I get stopped. I've already accepted that loss, and it's fine. If the stop is a price-based stop, so sometimes I don't have anything to lean against, and so I use a three or three-and-a-half point stop. If it's a three or three-and-a-half point stop, and I buy them here, and then I buy them here, and I buy them here, the three-point or let's call it a three-point stop, is computed from the theoretical average, from the consistent average. So at first, it was three points in between uh, as I buy these, and if I, or I sell these, or actually I buy them because I'm lower than the market, and so as I buy the third, my average becomes this middle. So I, now I'm measuring my stop as three points from there. Okay? But I know that, that this is the zone that I want to trade in. That does not change. I don't just keep adding and adding and hoping and dreaming. Okay, Be careful. we got three questions left. I have recently watched and followed the FT71 October 2017 webinar on changing markets and statistical analysis. I do not get harmonic rotations with Sierra charts, so I have calculated them using Excel. However, I'm not sure that they are accurate. Please advise how important it is to have harmonic rotation data for my instrument and point me towards resources and recommend, and can you recommend for identifying a better approach to calculating or obtaining the harmonic rotations? I don't know what to tell you about that because, because I just use a chart. You know, I just have a chart in IRT. If I want to know the harmonic rotation for the ES, I switch the instrument to the ES right there and if I want it on a one minute bar I keep I use that one minute bar I tell it okay the bin value or the tick value of the ES is 0.25 per point and I tell it how far back I want it to go 20 days do I want to use 20 days for my harmonics do I want to use uh, the day session or the night session or the full session so I'll use the day session because that's when I'm trading and I put all that in and I Tell it to recalc right there, and it spits out. It tells me the current one sigma rotation in the ES is 3.75. It was a little bit bigger a couple months ago, 3.75. It tells me that I need to set my zigzag pullback to two points right there, which is eight ticks, 
and so on. Uh, that's how I'm doing it. The old way I used to do it is I would export this information. I would export this information, these, these highs and lows. If there's an indicator in Sierra that, that marks the high and the low of a certain number of bars, you would export them, you would separate them, and you would basically distill from there what the volume profile would look like or the uh, statistical histogram look like, looks like and determine from the mode what one sigma is and so on. Now I just do it right here. Uh, and I believe there's, there's stuff in Sierra. Yes, somebody uh, posted saying it's easy to do rotations in Sierra. So I would suggest that someone, the, the questioner, post a request for help on Sierra support board. And maybe someone can help them. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, it used to take me two hours to figure it out. Now it takes maybe a minute and a half to change the parameters and get that uh, result. What else do we have? Okay, two left. Can you give me an idea of why the ES off the open? Uh, I'm not quite sure what they're saying. Can you give me an idea of why the ES off the open a good amount of the time will open on a bullish short term? and intermediate term and then it goes up looking like an open drive and then it drops like a rock to a support level where buyers come back and then resume the bullish behavior. Is this due to algos, etc. trying to stop out the retail crowd? Seems to happen often. Do you know by your process why this is happening? Okay, so one thing, I want to say this in a way that's not one thing you must let go of as a trader is the question why. There is no answer to the question why. It's like saying, why did my best friend say that in front of everybody? It's just, it's, it's very difficult to answer the question why, and it's irrelevant in trading. 99% of the time, it really is irrelevant because you don't know if that why is going to appear again. However, your observation is very true. Here's an open, here's a swing high, and then the market rotates all the way back through. Here's an open, here's a swing high, and the market rotates all the way back through. Here's an open, here's a swing high, the market rotates all the way through. Here's an open, a quick blip high, and rotates back. Here's an open, test lower, test high, and rotates all the way through. This is normal for a bullish regime. Okay, it's the, the, what's happening here is that participants immediately go and seek sellers. So you have to flip what your, what, the way you think of the market in order to understand auction, the auction process. The market, the market isn't moving up because it wants to get higher prices. It's not doing that. What it's doing is that the market's moving up to find the opposing side. So the kind of like if you if you want to sell your house in a hot market, what you're going to do, if you could through your realtor, if this was ethical and legal, what you could do is off you know list your price for seven hundred thousand dollars and see how many sellers you have or how many uh, list your house for seven hundred thousand dollars and see how many buyers you have, okay, and then list it again for 720,000 and find how many buyers you have. List again for 730,000 and find how many buyers you have. And you'll see that the number keeps decreasing as you raise your price. Now, what if you went from 700,000 to 690,000? Okay, I get more buyers, I get more buyers, I get more buyers. Ooh, I have a lot of buyers here. And then your neighbor comes in and says, well, you got a lot of buyers at 650, I'm gonna bid, I'm gonna put mine out for sale at 660. So what you've done with your neighbor in a competitive option, uh, auction in similar products, exactly the same home, same features, same everything, what you've done is you've discovered buyers. So you're, you're auctioning your house down until, you, until you, somebody bought it and you saw that your, your, your neighbor saw that there were 600 bids on your house, or I mean six bids on your house. I mean, I suppose 600. You can't suddenly go, oh, I have six bids. Okay, let me raise it up. You can't do that. It's, it's, that doesn't happen, right? It's unethical. It's not legal. But if you could, you would. Because what you would have done is you would have discovered, you've moved price down to discover whom. Who are you trying to discover? As you push prices down, you're trying to discover buyers. You're looking for buyers. 
okay? And so as soon as you find buyers and your neighbor says, oh my God, he got six bids on his house. It was a competitive bid. I'm not going to sell at 650. I'm going to sell at 670. And then they get to sell their house at a better price. And that's the low. That's the opening swing low or the IB low. That's what that is. And so the market moves up to find sellers, and then once it does, it rotates the other way. The question that we don't know, that we have to discover, is as it moves up and it finds sellers, are, are, are the sellers exhausted quickly so that buyers can then move the market up again, keep moving up again to find more sellers, or are the sellers motivated enough to keep pushing price down because they don't see prices continuing higher. Now, because you're asking this question at this current, in this current regime and the current market narrative and the current context, I understand why you ask it because trading is really hard here for the last couple of weeks. It's just kind of messy. Well, it's hard to tell who's participating, especially on a day like yesterday, just very grindy down, very methodical push down, and then all of a sudden, boom, boom, and it just runs everybody out. This is probably driven by short sellers covering. This looks like a short squeeze. I don't know why it does it, but for you as a trader, you have to put that aside and make sure that you're focused on what it did, the evidence. You're a detective. You're a lab technician doing a test, a chemical test. That's what you're after. Look, it pushed up. It could not find buyers. It came back, tried to push up again, and it fa fell into the prior day's range. And so I'm looking to sell. From there on out, I'm looking to sell. I'm looking for the short side. My biggest target is likely to be the next high-volume node, the next high-volume node, and so on. Those are stock zones. So I, I, there's no way for me to answer that without you know, somehow, if I knew the answer for that, I'd be, I'd be trading a huge fund. Uh, there's I no think that's a buy. great answer. Yeah. They're happy with the answer. All and right. the last question, is convergent trading built for more seasoned futures traders, or is it a system where a newer trader can develop from early in their journey into the field? So the intention was for convergent to be a, for stage two traders. Stage two traders, again, I'll bring this up. You can find the stages of competence right here. Go to the trading blog and look at this post right here. Okay? These are the stages of competence. Everybody goes through this. It's intended for stage two. It's intended for folks who are serious, who have who uh, who who know that they want to trade for a career. That's what it's intended for. It's not intended for somebody to come in who's doing this as a hobbyist or whatever. So I do I do go over stuff and I do explain things and we have content and and webinars and stuff that cover, that help you get up to speed. Uh, there's a webinar that I did just recently, maybe a month ago, called Basic Market Structures that helps people uh, kind of package the market in a way to understand it. Um, but it's not intended for somebody who doesn't know what a futures contract is uh, or they don't know how to trade or what software and so on. It's not meant to be, there's just not the resources or the capacity to, to go through the basics, basics. It's really meant for people who are already trading, are hitting a wall, are just starting over and over and seeing no progress. That's what it's for. It's like joining a prop room or a prop shop versus trading on your own, except it's, it's done online. That's that's really all I can say about that. Is that it? That is it. Our time is up. There all right. There's a number of questions that have not been, but I think for the most part, I've, I've gone through at least everybody's first question. Excellent. Thanks, everybody, for coming in. I appreciate you uh, being a part of this. And uh, since you registered, you will get the recording. We'll send that out to you. Good luck, everyone, tomorrow and uh, going forward. I'll catch you soon. Take care. Thanks, Yoda.